Welcome to the Physician Associate Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Physician Associate Podcast. My name is James. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by another Physician Associate. Welcome to the show, Melanie Wedgbury. Hi there, James. How are you? Fine, thank you. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Do you want to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Um, I'm a Physician Associate that works in general practice for APCN in the Ilminster area. My main job role at the moment is going into the care homes and helping with the care home provisions by providing weekly care home rounds which is a big push in the community at the moment so that's my main role and outside of that I also help cover kind of emergency home community visits and I do some on-call shifts in North Devon Hospital on the um, medical voter. Wow that's enough to keep you busy. (laughs) It definitely is. I think I started my training in 2019 um, and I'm one of those lovely physician associates that qualified right at the start of the COVID pandemic. Um, So when I qualified in January, um, one of the first jobs I did was the ICUs in London. So as the surge staff in, because there was a gap between where I got my hospital placement, um, which I'll tell you a bit more about my training and where my first hospital placement was, there was a bit of a gap. So I, had, I was one of the PAs that actually managed to go and have a bit of opportunity to do a bit of intensive care at work, not as a physician associate, but as a supportive role. So yeah, that was an interesting start to the career. Okay, that must have been really interesting, launching straight into looking after COVID patients in the middle of the pandemic. What what was that experience like for you? It was really interesting, actually, because um, it was one of those experiences I didn't expect to get thrown into. And they were specifically targeting fresh medical students or people that recently qualified or physician associates that newly qualified because there just wasn't enough staff with the workload. And I will say it was very, very surreal standing on a whole floor of a hospital, which was the Royal North London, on a night shift where it was quiet and just saw beds and beds and beds of people on ventilators. And they weren't, they weren't, the people you'd expect to see in an ICU so they were very very sick people but these were people that were 30 year olds or 40 year olds or pregnant women there was a lot of learning opportunities there I think and I think actually it was a really good opportunity that I've given something to that but yeah it's a surreal experience I don't think really we can highlight that I hope we don't have to go back and do it again is all I can say. Okay take me back to you as a person before you were a PA what's your background and how did you end up going to PA school? Yeah so this is actually the reason why I wanted to come on the podcast as a way of trying to encourage people who don't really know about the physician associate role or might not actually realise that they can get into education or medicine. So my background is I was brought up on a very well in poverty really so I was brought up on a council estate in Birmingham Um, My mum was a teenager when she had me and I ended up being the eldest of around 16 siblings. So we had a very chaotic, crazy household. And I grew up in this environment where education wasn't the most important thing. Survival was the most important thing. So you grew up in this environment where when you got older and you came of age, really the emphasis I used to get asked when I was growing up was how many children are you going to have? Who are you going to marry when you grow up? Now, I always knew being a child that I was, I had brains. So whenever I went to school, which was sporadic, I didn't really have a very good education at all. I used to do really, really well in grades. So I obviously had an underlying natural ability to learn. Okay. But that didn't stay with me. I left school when I was 15 with no GCSEs and I left home then. And I went out and got a very much a working career. I think the first job I got was in a um, banana packing factory. (laughs) It was very dull and very boring but it brought in money and I needed money and then I went on to have a life of really what was ingrained into me as a child was having and that was you have a partner and I met my children's father when I met him when I was 16 really Um, and then we went on to have a family and I had six children and I worked hard I had a job in the Royal Mail working as a postwoman Um, And I never really thought about getting into a career or pathway or medicine because I had six children and I left school when I was 15. And, you know, people like me 
really didn't understand. I didn't understand the opportunities that were there or was given to me. And looking back, I think that's really, really sad. And it's something that I think we really need to look to change. So how it changed for me, I remember, I think I'd been working for the postal service for about three years and I fell over and I twisted my ankle and I I had a significant injury, which meant that I couldn't go and do my rounds. So they put me in this area we called the cage or the hatch where people would come and get their parcels. And I remember being in this area for a short time, about two weeks, and the system that they were using to collect the parcels was slow and it needed improving. So I went to the management and said, look, if you do this, we're, we're going to get a better productivity. People are going to come in quicker, um, going to have happier people. And what I didn't realise was I was naturally problem solving a problem that wasn't given to me. And the management picked up on that. And they said, would you like to go to a management apprenticeship scheme? And I was like, oh, wow, I don't think I could do that. And that really showed me, as the first time someone had said to me, you know, do you realise you can, you can do this? Um, so I started doing that management scheme. And I think this was, we're coming up to around 2011 now. And there was a lot of um, postal strikes around that time and a lot of disruption. Um, and I just found that moving from being a postal worker into the management just wasn't the direction that I wanted to go in. And someone had mentioned the access course to me in college. And they said, did you know you can do an access course? And after a year's access course, you can get into university. Uh, So I'd realised, you know, actually, I've been shown that I can do something. What do I want to go and do in university? And someone said to me, you can do anything. You can change the world. So I said, right, I'm going to cure cancer. This is what I want to do. I want to go and cure cancer and I'll be something great in the world. And I'll have the ability to do that. Looking back, that was a bit of a naive, (laughs) a naive thing to think I could do because that's when my learning came in. So I did this year's access course and I managed to get into the University of Bristol on the back of it, which was a real good achievement. I originally attempted to go into virology and they were realistic. They come back to me and they said, you have no chemistry background. You've got a year's access, but maybe you'll do really well at physiology. You've got really good problem solving and this will cover the whole body. And we think you'd be good at this. So that's really where it opened up to me. And I'd had a few years after working really, really hard where I had just a few pockets of people telling me, oh, you have the ability to do that and we can, we can give you these, these doors and open them. I did have a lot of barriers along the way, which I'm more than happy to talk about. But moving on from Bristol, I, when I was in, I failed my first year, completely failed it. <laughs> It was chemistry. I just didn't do well at it. And they come back to me and they said, do you want to do pharmacology instead? I said, is it different? They went, yes, it is different, but it isn't. But we think you'd be good at it. And then I passed. I passed my first year the second time round. Um, and then I got diagnosed in the second year with dyslexia. So that was the issues that I was having. It never been picked up because I hadn't been in education before. We solved that problem. And in the second year, this is where I found the PA course because I'd had a, I'd had a couple of years now. I'd failed my first year completed my second year, realised it. I, I'm a people person. I'm not going to do well in research. There's a, there was a lot more into looking down research pathways that are better for different personality types, but they're not good for me. And someone come and talk to us about the physician associate course. And when I was a child, I used to think doctors were gods. To me, a doctor was a god. Whenever I went out, they were the most caring people in the world. And I would have loved to have been a doctor. Um, as a mature student, it's doable, but there's a lot more years it takes out of your life. And with a family that I have, it's not feasible. It just wouldn't be feasible. But someone had opened this PA world to me as being, I'd be able to do the job that I'd really wanted to do, get really involved in medicine, very hands-on, and it was accessible. And all I had to do was complete my uni course and get some clinical background. So that was when I decided I'm going to do the PA course in year two. I didn't have any clinical background. I'd always been brought up in a clinical family. So my nan was always a warden. So ever since the age of five, I'd been traveling around and seeing the elderly in their homes and seeing her care. So I was brought up in an environment that did talk about the care and profession, but didn't have any background myself. So I went to um, Musgrove Park Hospital in Taunton, the accident and emergency section. They had um, some jobs, healthcare assistant. And I went to my interview and I was very open and honest. I said, I want to be a physician associate. I'm doing this in uni. I need some clinical experience. I'd love to get a job here that worked around my uni. And they said, okay, come, we'll we'll train you up when we can. 
and work hard for us and we'll bring you in. And I spent the next two, three years working in the emergency department's HCA. And that background was invaluable, really. I would advise anyone that's trained in this profession to go and work as a healthcare assistant in a hospital because it, that taught me and I think built my building blocks into being the PA profession. But it was also important for me to get that background because after my first degree, I got a 2 2 in my first degree. Now, obviously, you know, the entry requirements to get into the course, you normally really need a 2 1 or a first, but Plymouth University accepted you on with a 2 2 and with relevant healthcare experience. So that's when I got into Plymouth Uni. And really, history is from there, I managed to do the course. And I actually did a lot better in the Physician Associate course. So I came out of that with merit, considering I'd got a 2-2. And, and the, I feel that's because the learning style was a lot different, the PA course and the practical. And it really gave me the opportunity to shine. Wow. Do you mind me asking, and if these are rude questions or you'd rather not say, please let me know, I don't want to offend. One of my best mates uh, who has a sort of similar upbringing, I would guess, a uh, very large family, had kids himself when he was very young, um, dropped out of school, all that kind of stuff. And he's now working with me as a PA. He often, he doesn't sound like the rest of us, he says. He, he's aware in his own mind that he sounds working class to the, to the patients. <laughs> and he thinks that that sometimes is a burden or does, does himself down. Well, it's, the, it's the complete opposite. So you can't see here, but I'm, I'm very tattooed. So I've got a tattooed sleeve. My hair's normally colourful and I'm very work, working class. So in uh, when I do the care home rounds, your HCA team nurses are working class. They're not, not medics. Put me in a room of medics sometimes, but you put me in the rest of the hospital, about 98% of the hospital, your patient, patient quality is going to be so much better because you're approachable. Like I said, I used to see doctors as gods, working class people see doctors, they obviously see them as gods or they, they think that they're making up science. It's one or the other, you know, or they think they, they, they just have a disconnect because actually they are disconnected. You know, they, they can talk about inequality and health inequalities, but a lot of them don't understand it. I remember um, talking to someone about putting electric on your meter. So I was like, you know, when you've got to put your emergency on, uh, and this person didn't know what I meant by emergency credit. Uh, yeah, well, growing up, you always heard the beat of beep and you'd have to, oh, gosh, we've got to go down and get the emergency. And it's those skills that he will have. He won't understand he has them, but I would definitely employ them. So I, I use I use my working class. I don't I don't try not to not to be because it just it works. It works so much better. And he, he probably feels like a fish out of water because he hasn't realized that yet. Just got to realize it. That's what I try and tell him that actually yeah. 75, 80% of our patients are like you, mate, and they probably like you better than they like me because I sound too posh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just, it really employs. And sometimes as well, just knowing, I always sit down next to people and hold their hands or I'll go, oh, I've got to have a cup of tea, haven't we? Got to have a good old brew, best medicine and just bringing it really down. Because medicine, I would say, is 90% communication. If you... Say if you had someone that needed antibiotics, but you think they should wait for 12 hours, for example, and you've, committed, and you've communicated in a really open, friendly manner, and they get six, sick in six hours, so they need the antibiotics, the people will be, oh, that's okay, we communicated well, we just had to wait, it hasn't worked, but we've done right. If you're not communicating well, a complaint is going in, and that's the difference. The, the outcome hasn't changed. The environment and situation has changed because that that's that's what you're creating just openness and yeah it's a shame he feels like that also tell him not to give a damn what people think the moment you do you weigh yourself down it's really scary the first year i was absolutely i still am i've got massive imposter syndrome <laughs> we all do imposter syndrome is there and then someone asks me a question i talk and my head's going are you sure? Are you sure and i know i know it but the imposters and it's a thing he just probably has it a bit louder Thank you, Melanie, for explaining a bit about your story. If it's not too rude to ask, do you think coming from that background is a bad thing as a physician associate or actually can it give you strength as a PA? Oh, I think it can definitely give you strength. Any Anybody's background is appropriate. 
I think when we put ourselves in boxes, it's no longer appropriate because we are the people that put ourselves in those boxes. From my background, if you look people, you know, that have health inequalities, that really need to be seeing their GPs that are going to hospitals on a regular occasion, they tend to come from a working class background with poverty. And I just may have a few insights or understandings that other people might not have, like the understanding of sitting in your room and not wanting to to answer a door because the door's banging because they might be that person that's collecting your money each week because you can't afford the £10 to give them. You know, and that anxiety that goes with that. So when someone's coming in the room and telling me about that anxiety, I can understand that because that's actually what a lot of people go through. It just doesn't get out there as much. And that's the disconnect between, I think, medicine and people that um, don't have the access to the education or the knowledge that they've got the access to the education is... Do you find yourself feeling a bit like a fish out of water in certain situations? Because obviously medicine is a career and I guess by extension PA is a career it's often seen as quite a high high class, is that the right word? Or quite a strong hierarchy of academic and well-to-do people that go into medicine. Do you know what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, I completely understand. I say, yeah, I do. I feel like a fish out of water a lot of the time. It doesn't mean that I don't fit in, but um, the friends that I hang around with, they don't necessarily have careers, some do, um, but they're good, strong, hardworking individuals. So they, I can't really talk medicine or career with most of them because they wouldn't understand. And I do fit in in my job role and I've got lots of friends. However, I would feel that I would be a fish out of water because not many people have six children and those responsibilities or understand it. The amount of times people find out that I'm doing the, the role that I am and then I mention six children, that absolutely gobsmacked and the whole focus doesn't then focus on me as an individual it does go to this person that has six children and actually that that's a shame because I do feel and it's, it might be a little bit controversial that I've, I've had male counterparts that will mention their children but they don't get the same questions that I do as a as a mother with six children that's learned in medicine so sometimes being out of water can be in navigating them however because that sounded a bit negative and I don't want to say it in a negative way. I, I invite all questions. They're really appropriate. We should ask questions. People tend to be impressed. They don't, it doesn't tend to be in a judgment. They tend to say, oh my goodness, how did you manage this? And I'm like, oh, you know, people can manage this. I just wish more people knew, you know, the abilities that they've got and the support network that's there. And that's, that's really a message I'm trying to get out with coming on this podcast that barriers are there because we as individuals put those barriers in or people around us don't understand that those barriers can be taken away I think it's fair to say it's just listening to you explain that is opening my eyes in terms of had a relatively straightforward and quite lucky upbringing uh, quite sheltered quite supportive and yeah not everybody's afforded the same opportunities it's quite important that we encourage people from various backgrounds to come into the PA profession and widen that access yeah, absolutely. But also I've known I've known people that have also come from your background and have we have the same struggles and difficulties and same barriers and boxes. They're just written in a different language. Good way to put it. Now in terms of your clinical work, you're doing quite a lot of work with care home reviews. Yes. Moving back to when my first I was in Plymouth University and I was one of the first PAs to go to Exeter Hospital so I was always going to be employed by Exeter Hospital as the first PA cohort there Um, and I was due to be working there for two years but after a year I decided to leave because of location the one barrier to working and education with a family is moving you can't move around as easily so whatever I did I had to travel so to uni I'd travel two hours a day and then to work with Exeter was an hour a day so actually that's two hours for exits there and back so Plymouth I was traveling for four hours a day just to complete the course but it's just a sacrifice I had to do so I um, saw a job role come up um, advertising for a physician associate to help do the care home rounds now this is something that's a nationwide initiative under the DES and everyone's attacking it in a different way so how we're doing it was we have an MDT meeting with multiple professionals via say teams um, and then we go in the care homes, which I lead in the care homes, 
with a pharmacist and a care coordinator and um, the care homes will bring people to me to review of different levels and it can it can involve anything does this person need an OT referral or do they need to see um, pharmacy for an SMR do I need to raise them to their GP for a more serious illness that's what I do um, weekly it wasn't set up before I started it wasn't really known how I was going to go and I was given a bit of free reign of how I structure them but I, I will say since being in them it's been very very successful good for you that sounds like a great opportunity mm-hmm. I'm just going back to thoughts about sometimes when we are treating patients and certainly in primary care we don't know our patients educational background or what their careers are what they're interested in necessarily but actually as a physician associate you said yourself you used to see doctors as gods Mm -hmm. perhaps we don't or I certainly don't appreciate the sort of role model or opportunity to inspire people to go become a PA that my everyday clinic affords me to to talk to people about becoming a PA there's always the opportunity to open that up now and think oh is there a person that I'm seeing that could we afford the opportunity? I've already done two references for people that I've seen in care homes that have been working. And I've said, well, have you ever thought about getting into the nursing profession? And they hadn't. And then I explained how you can go through the HCA route and up through. You wouldn't need to go to university. You wouldn't necessarily need to go to university before getting onto a PA course by paying yourself. The NHS could pay a whole pathway for, you know, the way that we are going into education and I do think as well if you get someone that hasn't necessarily gone into a career from a background you also break in a cycle with the children so an example of that is my son my son's now doing the ECA to paramedic route because he went out of school and got into the healthcare route and that was because I knew later on that we do that and that that filters down so it's it's really positive I think we should give every opportunity to just tell everyone tell everyone how we did it, let people know your background, tell people the positives, the negatives, and just offer those opportunities. It's free. Information and guidance is free for everyone. And you're so right, actually, isn't it? Education can then change lives in a way that healthcare can't. It it can break cycles and change family circumstances. I I had the opportunity to do some volunteering in Malawi when I was in university. It's something I'd always wanted to do. And just taking a country like that as well, that's in poverty, um, seeing aspects of education that could could change people's life. For example, if you had a poor person in a third world country and they had five children, if you just send one of those children to school, they can then provide for the whole household and then provide education further. Everything boils down to education. And let's think of a smaller picture here. Let's not think, you know, the education of getting into a top university and going into top med school and being a consultant. Let's think of the the basic education, you know. This is what we do. One of our jobs is to educate people on health. People that don't understand you should have five a day vegetables. You're offering out all that education. What we do in our main role, we are educating people to the best of our ability yeah no, you're absolutely right communication education being a clinician it's all about being able to teach your patients mm-hmm. some things isn't it really and and to learn as a student yourself have you faced any discrimination or prejudice I, I find it completely the opposite completely the opposite I find that because for example I'm the first person out of my family to go to university that benefited me in my interviews because people want to build people up. No, I've not hit any prejudice at all. Anything, any conceptions that I had about prejudice that I was going to hit were given to me by myself. Like I said earlier, I've got a, I've got tattoos. And I didn't know that when I got these tattoos, I'd be in a career that needed to be bare below the elbow. I felt that when I was going in, people would judge me for my tattoos. People will do this. And it isn't them. It's it's me. I'm I'm judging myself. People have never said that to me. It might be something I've picked up off social media or an insecurity I've got about myself from earlier on days because you care a lot more in your 20s than about things like that than you do in your 30s, for example. Um, but no, I haven't hit any barriers of prejudice. Good to hear. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking to me about your story. If people have heard this episode, they may have got more questions or it may have sparked ideas or or concerns that they want to share themselves. How is it best that people can get in touch with you? 
yeah so I am um open to if people want to get hold of me or I can send you my email if anyone wants any further information any pathways they can go through how funding happened how was I able to fund all of this because there is funding out there available how was I able to do childcare? how was I able to travel they can approach me outside they can find me on LinkedIn you know I would really really like to help anyone that wants to know more of how we go about doing this Perfect. Thank you, Melanie. And I will leave your contact details in the show notes of this episode so that people can find out how to get in touch with you on their device. Melanie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast with me today. Thank you very much, James. And thanks to you for listening as well. I hope you found that an interesting and hopefully inspiring uh, episode of the podcast. And it might be useful for you to share it with somebody you know um, to see if they can feel inspired about becoming a physician associate as well. If you've got an interesting story, As a physician associate, or if you've got an idea for a future episode of the PA Podcast, I would love to hear from you. Please get in contact with me. I'm on social media at PA Podcast UK, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. And I hope you'll join me again for the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Physician Associate Podcast.